Okay. Our guest tonight is a native of New Hampshire where through her father gained a huge appreciation for the era of the American Revolution. She went to Syracuse University, go orange. She's worked for small newspapers in Colorado and then for the Rocky Mountain News, News in Denver. She's written freelance writing for the Los Angeles Times and of course was the city editor at the Santa Barbara News Press until 2006 when she was one of the original six, that's not a hockey term, who were among the staff who received the University of Oregon's Arsil Payne Award for Ethics and Journalism. It's an annual honor for journalists who report with integrity despite personal, political, or economic pressure. Most recently, she was editor of a Southern California agricultural magazine, but this is her first foray into fiction. Please welcome Jane Hulse. Thank you so much for coming. It's so great to see you. And, and thank you, Michael, for hosting this event and Chaucer's. Um, are you going to ask me something? Yeah, I've got a, okay. just a couple questions and I'll turn it over to you too. You're a journalist for your li entire life. Um, now you write fiction. First of all, did you, <laughs> when you were younger, did you want to write fiction? Was this something you wanted to do when you were younger? I did. I wanted to write fiction, um, I'd say from a pretty early age, but I also liked journalism too. Mm -hmm. I grew up in New Hampshire, the live free or die state, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, where everything is named colonial or Yankee. And when I was a little girl, I read the Little Maid series um, about the American Revolution, mm -hmm. every single volume, all 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I always wanted to write something. Mm -hmm. um, the American Revolution is kind of in my bones uh, because of where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, the house I grew up in was from the colonial period, um, and it was across the street from the tavern where the Minutemen rallied wow. on the morning before they marched off to Massachusetts at the start of the, the war. And my dad never let me forget that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was very interested in everything colonial and uh, collected everything he could get uh, from that era. And one of the things he did was um, he took me on a hike deep in the woods once and showed me this cave where uh, the story goes that a loyalist hid out from the rebels during the war. And it was kind of from there that I learned that not everybody supported the revolution and there were about 20 to 30 percent of the of the people in the colonies who didn't support it. And and they were treated pretty badly. Tar and feathering is a is a real thing. So that's kind of how I got in, ingrained into mm -hmm. Um, writing about that period. Interesting. As, as far as making, before you start, I just wanted to know about making the transition from, from journalism to fiction. News. Well, let's see if memory serves. Last time I was in, in the newsroom was a few years ago. And of course, we know that being in a newsroom, we have to be objective and accurate and right on deadline and there's all this camaraderie and you're interviewing people and editors are yelling at you and you're trying to write something and you've got 30 minutes left and finally you do it you're done and then you can go home and feel like you've done something and mm -hmm. when i turned to fiction i kind of missed all of that so i would take my computer and go to a, like a coffee shop and just mm -hmm. park myself for hours at a time because writing fiction is such a solitary thing. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I needed some buzz around me um, just to write anything. Um, writing news is very fast and immediate. Writing fiction takes forever, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
if I write two or three pages in a day, I'll look at it the next day and go, oh my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, and I have to redo it. And, you know, it's sort of like two steps forward and, and one step back. But I have to say that, that writing fiction, the beauty of writing fiction is you get to make up shit. <laughs> and you can, you can emote all over the place. So, <laughs> that's what I like about it. <laughs> so without further ado, would you okay. do a little reading and talk yeah, about Yeah, yeah. Well, I see an awful lot of newspaper friends here. And, and I feel like I'm back in the newsroom, sweating bullets at deadline, Jerry hovering over my shoulder. <laughs> and and I, I miss that. And paraphrasing Citizen Kane, I think it would be fun to run a newspaper. <laughs> um, there's so much talent right here in this room. Jerry and David Freed is this great novelist. Um, We've got a whole bunch of reporters I worked with, really good kick-ass reporters, and my husband is here. He's a pretty good reporter, too. <laughs> um, but enough about you. <laughs> as, as it turns out, my book has a newspaper, and it, it has a pompous, pissy, self-absorbed publisher. <laughs> and of course, uh, a pushy, honest to a fault reporter. Um, and it has sex. Too <laughs> much <laughs> sex. I just hope it's enough to get me banned in Florida. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> Well, let me take you back to 1776 in New York City. And at that time, New York was pretty small. There were only about 25,000 people living there. And they were all crammed into the southern tip of Manhattan. But it's still a very cosmopolitan place. It's got several, several newspapers. It's got perfume shops, wig shops, coffee houses. And it even has a red light district with 400 prostitutes. Wow. Um, it's located in the shadow of Trinity Church, the, the biggest and the most respected church in New York. Mm. And it's on land that the church rents out for cheap. So you won't believe this, but this seedy area was called the holy ground. <laughs> I just love that. Um, at this time, the British have control of the city and they're, they're winning the war. Um, in fact, they capture so many rebel prisoners that they run out of jail space in Manhattan. So they turn their old decrepit battleships into these floating jails and they cram prisoners by the thousands onto these old wrecks, and they moor them in a place called Wallabout Bay, which is just off the shore of Brooklyn. So they're, they're stuffed into the bellies of these stinking hell holes and essentially left to die. And, and they do. They die of starvation, beatings, hangings, diseases. By the end of the war in 1783, the death toll from the prison ships is at least 11,000 men. And to put that into perspective, it's, it's way more than all the Americans who were killed in all the battles of the American Revolution. I think that number was around close to 7,000. And who knew? I, I never knew this when I was growing up. I never heard a word about it. Um, and I, I, I just think it's astounding. So 
with that said, I'd like to read a little bit from chapter one. So bear with me. Public speaking is not my favorite thing to do. And the first line of the book pretty much sums that up. So here we go. Chapter one. Surely this is hell. I can't think. I can't sleep. Not with mother snoring up a storm on the ragged straw mattress inches away. Not with the occasional boom of cannon fire in the distance. Please, just a moment of privacy and peace in this cramped, leaky attic we now call home. Is that unreasonable? I tiptoe across the rough floorboards and retrieve my diary from its hiding place behind the chimney. A necessity since mother feels compelled to know every last thought in my head. With my quill pen, I write November 1st, 1776. Samuel's touch sends ripples of pleasure through my body. I ache for more. Am I wicked for such thoughts when I don't even know if I shall marry him? The candle flickers out before I finish. Damn. In the dark, I slip under the patchwork quilt beside mother and little Benjamin and close my eyes. The warmth feels good, but sleep doesn't come. I hear the skittering of mice interrupted by the ear-splitting racket from mother's gaping mouth. A year ago, we lived in a stately brick house with a mahogany grandfather clock and rugs in every room. Father, the only person on earth who's ever understood me, was alive then. Unlike mother and Samuel, he never thought me a fool for wanting to be a writer. Just as I'm remembering the woodsy smell of father's pipe, a sharp rap on the door jolts me. Likely someone needing mother's services, again. Why babies always choose to be born in the middle of the night mystifies me. Despite the pounding, mother barely twitches. I stumble down the dark, narrow stairs and unlatch the door a crack, careful not to wake the Harkins family who live below us. There at the door stands a tall, stone-faced British soldier in a faded red uniform a musket in one hand and a lantern in the other. I'm here for Mary Barrett, the midwife. Captain Pendleton asked that I summon Mrs. Barrett on a delicate matter. What delicate matter? This isn't the usual frantic father to be desperate for mother's help. I'm not at liberty to say. Now I'm desperately curious and not a little wary. At least do the courtesy of telling me who you are. I'm Lieutenant Daniel Pritchard, Captain Pendleton's aide. I study his wooden soldier stare for any clue. I'll fetch my mother. I traipse back up two flights of stairs to the attic, wondering why a tight-lipped red coat needs mother's services. True, she can set a broken arm or stitch a gash from the ax but it's catching newborns that she does best. Mother isn't perplexed at all. It could be the devil himself at the door and she'd calmly dress and gather the leather satchel with all her herbs and ointments for snake bites, fever, and birthing babies. Sarah, you stay with your brother until I'm back. Ordinarily, I'd slip back into bed, but I'm dying to know what it's all about. Mother, it's not wise for you to go alone into such uncertainty. She looks relieved and even a little pleased by my concern. Very well, we'll leave Benjamin with Mrs. Harkins. I dress quickly, skipping the torturous whalebone stays. No need to squeeze my waist down to the size of a thimble. I'm already tall and thin, not in an unpleasing way. I slip on my gown and apron and jam my unruly red curls under a dark bonnet. Mother must think I've had a change of heart about becoming her assistant. 
It's her fervent wish that I accompany her on calls and learn the trade. But I loathe everything about childbirth. I've already made it clear I'd rather dive into poison ivy than witness another blessed event, says she calls it. <laughs> the last one was so messy, so bloody, so ghastly that I vomited all over the floor and then fainted dead away, much to mother's exasperation. Yet here I am, about to follow a solemn red coat to God knows where on a chilly pitch black night. I wrap my wool cape tighter. Where are we going? At least tell us that, I mutter as we step into the dark, quiet street. Hush, child, mother whispers. I hate being hushed and I'm not a child. I'm 17 and certainly possess enough wit to work for Livingston's New York Royal Gazette, though mother finds newspapers as dignified as whoredom. <laughs> <laughs> I hold my tongue as we make our way over bumpy cobblestones, struggling to keep up with the soldier. His creaky lantern barely lights the way, but I make out the darkened houses on our road, the occasional farm and wood, we pass loose chickens, a cow sauntering down the road. We're barely a half mile north of Wall Street in the Loyal Gazette. We're going to the waterfront, Lieutenant Pritchard finally says. Why? No need for our services there, I ask. More silence. Mother scowls at me as if I've just spoken ill of King George. She was thrilled when the British whipped Washington's army and took command of New York two months ago. In fact, most of the city now backs the British, including my pompous know-it-all employer, Jonah Livingston, and of course, Samuel Mason, the man mother believes is heaven sent to marry me. The East River is only a few blocks away. Warehouses line the narrow streets, along with shops selling rope, sailcloth, tar, tools, barrels. Soon I see huge cargo ships, the rigging on their masts, clanging in the salty air. I have a bad feeling about this little adventure, but I'm curious to a fault, as mother likes to say. At the waterfront, the lieutenant directs us to a flat bottom boat tied to a dock in the shallows. We're going to the ship on the other side of the river, he says, as he sets the oarlocks in place. No need to worry, it's calm night and I ply these waters daily. Moments later, we're rolling in the swells, my stomach lurching wildly a pox on that smug Pritchard at the oars. Damn his boss Pendleton and damn my curiosity. It only gets worse when I inhale a stink so powerful I gag. Then the old hulk comes into view. I look to mother for some reassurance and her wary eyes give me no comfort. Surely there are no women in need out there, I shout over the creaking of the oars and the water slapping the side of the boat. The decrepit ship's mast is missing along with its guns. The portholes are boarded up. I feel dizzy, whether from the stink or the choppy waters, and I fight to hang on to the contents of my stomach. What kind of a ship is this? And what hellish mission have you brought us on? I ask, cramming a lavender scented handkerchief over my nose. And I think I'll leave it right there. Hopefully um, mm. I have your interest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. If anybody has questions. So you really set us up in terms of sense of place how did you do your research did you how did you do your research for New York and well I I read a book about the prison ships 
that mm -hmm. came out in, in 2017. And I was really taken with it. And I thought well, that would be a great backdrop for oh. a story. Um, and so I read everything I could get my hands on. I read books on uh, the war in New York, what New York was like at the time. Mm -hmm. I have so many books you would not believe. <laughs> um, so, and, and then the internet, I would Google everything that I needed to as I was writing because you can't just write a simple sentence when you're doing historical fiction. You've mm -hmm. got to Google every little detail to make sure you're not using a word that wasn't invented then or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a bit of research. For, for you, was that the easiest part is to do the research as opposed to the creative side of writing fiction? Well, I really, really love research. I love going down these rabbit holes mm -hmm. and being lost for a couple hours researching like what kind of buttons to put on this mm -hmm. uniform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I could spend hours, just, you know, total days missing everything but what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. um, that's what I did. Okay. Um, at, at what point did you realize that you had reached that sort of critical mass and, uh, and could ostensibly achieve some degree of verisimilitude in your prose? Well, um, it took it took probably four years to to do this, and I had the basis of a story kind of in in another book that I had written previously, but not published about a a loyalist family that was persecuted by the rebels, and the main character in that book ends up in New York working for a newspaper, so kind of picked up on that and started the second one and you know with any hope at all I'll get the first one published too mm -hmm. but you never mm. know so what was your um, writing schedule or calendar of sitting down and actually putting writing pen, pen well I wish I could say I got up at five in the morning and it worked for six hours but no I, I didn't do that <laughs> um, I, I worked maybe when I was writing it, three to four hours a day, maybe. And a lot of it, I would just take my computer and go somewhere and just, you know, write. And, but I think I told Jerry this, even though you're not writing all the time, you're still thinking about it and you're driving somewhere, you're at the gym. I, I, I know I was constantly plotting and figuring things out. Um, yeah. so. Did your characters take the story in a way that you had not thought would be the way you would go? Or was it certain, did you have it all plotted out and it all worked for you that way? I kind of had it all plotted out. At least I knew where certain points were going to be. And then um, I just kind of filled in those gaps. And, you know, you want the arc to be here. And um, it's kind of like doing a puzzle almost. Um, Hmm. But anybody else? Go ahead. Well, I, I, just, just as a comment, um, as Jane's husband, when she says working three or four hours a day on it, that might be true, but I can't tell you the number of dinners we have where you <laughs> look up and say, oh, aren't thou talking? <laughs> so she was pretty involved. <laughs> it was very bad company for a while. <laughs> so, the, I mean, you tell the story from the perspective of Sarah mm -hmm. uh, in his first person, and mm -hmm. it's just very skillful the way that you sort of alternate her interior life or her conversation with other people, her actions, her observation. At what point did you did you find that voice? Did you have that from the beginning? Uh, did you have false starts before getting there? Oh, definitely. Um, I never thought I would write in first person. The first novel that I wrote that never got published was in, in third person, and I felt more comfortable with that. Um, but then I started reading a little bit of fiction in first person, and it, 
and it has this immediacy to it. And I thought with this story, I wanted it to have a lot of action. So I thought the first person would fit, but then you kind of have to go into the head of a 17 year old. And um, that, was, that was not easy. Parts of her are parts of me, but there are a lot of parts of her that I wish had been me <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, but her struggle to be accepted in, in the news business and in journalism, I just, I mean, you got into it at a time when it still really was dominated that's by true. men. And, that's true. and it, it wasn't easy. I mean, the numbers didn't grow very fast. So how much of, the, how much of that is reflected in, in her, do you think? Quite a, quite a bit, I think. And it's still <laughs> going on. I mean, look mm -hmm. at today. Um, we have a long ways to go with women's rights, even in newspapers. To kind of carry off of Jerry's comment, um, I, you know, reading where Sarah talks about her frustration about being given stories about women's hairdos instead of what she really wants to cover. Mm -hmm. um, those of us who were in newsrooms, like fairly recently, but going back a couple of decades up mm -hmm. until recently, we still struggled against that um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what of your own personal experience informed some of Sarah's frustrations mm -hmm. and experiences. Mm -hmm. My first newspaper job was in Colorado and I was in charge of the society page mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I mean, there were weddings on that page, um, and stuff that you wouldn't find today. And I really wanted to write real news and real features. And, you know, it was kind of tough going from that, that was my first job, to, to other things. And I did see men who um, went ahead of me. James, I'm wondering what was going on in your life when you were 17. Oh. Because it, well, you must have gone, you must have gone down to that to a, to a degree. I mean, you know, to a degree of like what it felt like to be, you know, sort of an adult but treated as a child. I mm -hmm. mean, I just wondered mm -hmm. kind of biographically, where were you and what, what were you in high school? Yes, I was in high school. And I, I remember chafing at... at uh, regulations my parents set um, as Sarah does in the book so that part of it is really relevant um, and I always thought that my parents were more strict than anybody else's um, and then I realized later on that they really weren't <laughs> <laughs> one else? more question uh, exactly how much fiction uh, made its way into the 10,000 stories that you went off the city <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Not that I wouldn't have liked to. <laughs> well, and conversely, how much, how much of your book is, is fiction versus nonfiction? Hmm. Well, there's a lot of history in there. Um, but the characters are all fiction. One of them is based on a newspaper publisher from that period. Um, Sarah's mother is a midwife and she's based on uh, a midwife I read a book about um, to do this, this particular book. Um, but I think all the other characters are really from my own imagination. Um, and I try to incorporate historical events along the way. Like there really was an attempt on George Washington's life and some guy did get hung, hanged for it. Um, so things like that, I tried to drop in at the right time. So 
Last question. Oh, last question. Tammy. Um, as one of your former reporters, and you were <laughs> my editor, always improving everything I, that you touched, always just made it a little bit better. I really truly mean that. Oh, okay. How good of an editor are you of your own? Like, who's your editor? <laughs> do you do you feel like that's a unique? Got it. Got a good one much. at home. That's nice. Yeah, it was yeah. an in-house job. Yeah, <laughs> nice. He gave me a discount. Um, <laughs> but when I first started writing um, her previous book, I, I was in um, a couple of different writing groups, and you get feedback from other writers, and, and that's good. For this one, a lot of it was during the pandemic, and um, so I didn't have an awful lot of feedback from other people, and Steve really um, did the final edit on the book, and he did a great job. He managed to cut out how many thousand words? Uh, there were some words. Little words. <laughs> they were good words, too. <laughs> <laughs> and they're gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say adverbs, watch out. <laughs> well done. What about the, the whole process of finding a publisher? Um, oh. That. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a, because it's not self-published, which is mm -hmm. an amazing feat for a lot of books today. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started writing fiction, the first, the first book and the second book, I queried a ton of agents. Um, I think I counted them up the other night, and altogether I think there were 60 that I queried um, with no, no luck at all. Um, and I think part of the reason might have been, well, it could have been the book, but <laughs> part of it was um, I pitched it as a young adult book and young adult books traditionally are a very contemporary first person um, or they're fantasy dragons, whatever. And this is, this is, you know, American Revolution doesn't have a lot of sex appeal. So, um, so after I realized that I probably wasn't going to get an agent, I just started writing to smaller publishers, um, some that specialized in historical fiction and nonfiction, and that's how I found Fireship Press. So they, they specialize in um, nautical and military fiction and nonfiction. So it was a good fit. And it is sexy. It well, is I like sexy. to think so. so. <laughs> <laughs> Should it have more? <laughs> well, well, Jane, thank you very, very much. And congratulations on your book. Yeah. Again, thank you.